And uh, it's, it's really, I'm amazed that there's so many of you here the, the morning after the party. Uh, so who went to the party last night? Uh, that's respectable. So yeah, thank you for joining us for this discussion about a really important topic, uh, the, the sounds of life, the sounds of nature, what we can learn by listening to the natural world. And we have a, a wonderful guest here today. Karen Becker has published this incredible book, which I really recommend that you read. It's called The Sounds of Life. Uh, and there was an article for the German speakers among us uh, uh, a few days ago in the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung uh, called Technik für Umwelt, uh, Technology for Environment, uh, which uh, is, is a really great introduction into some of Karen's ideas. But you actually can go even better than that. You get uh, Karen Becker in the flesh. Uh, so Karen is a, an author, an entrepreneur, a scholar, uh, uh, a social entrepreneur and is uh, uh, from Canada originally, Dutch-Canadian, as I learned this morning, which is uh, quite an unusual combination, uh, living in Vancouver uh, and uh, has an incredible curiosity and fascination for, for our natural environment. And, uh, really this, this theme of biodiversity, which is perhaps uh, sometimes the second fiddle to climate change in discussions, but is at least as important, if not uh, even more important, what we're experiencing right now with biodiversity. So I think what we're going to have is, is Karen will first uh, give us uh, 10 minutes to kind of introduce her vision about the sounds of life, and then we're going to have a, a little bit of a chat. So over to you, Karen. Thank you for coming to DLD. Thank you. So we've heard a lot at this conference about the potential for artificial intelligence to revolutionize human economies and societies. Here today I'm going to be telling you about the potential for artificial intelligence to revolutionize our relationship with the natural world. These are digital bioacoustics and ecoacoustics recording devices. Moore's law applies to these um, and we have seen a rapid reduction in cost and portability over the past decade. These are tiny microphones that can be installed and are being installed in the depths of the Amazon, the remotest reaches of the Arctic, the Antarctic, the depths of the ocean, the remotest mountaintops. And scientists and amateurs actually have been recording the sounds of nature, the hidden sounds of nature, because much communication, much acoustic communication in nature occurs beyond human hearing range in the high ultrasound, above your human hearing range, and in the low infrasound, below your human hearing range. Let's listen to just one example of the sounds that this kind of technology can record. So I'd like you to guess who or what this is. So that's actually a bat. Bats are often, of course, associated in Western culture with blood-sucking vampires of the night, vectors of zoonotic disease. It turns out they're more similar to you than you might believe. And a lot of what we're learning about bats has occurred through the recording of large bioacoustic data sets and the use of artificial intelligence, deep learning algorithms to decode the patterns in bat communication. So it turns out that bats congregate, they make friends. They remember favors, they hold grudges, they have individual names, they speak to one another and use those names identifying gender, kin, family. Bats um, fight over food and resources, they trade food for sex, they socially distance and go quiet when ill. Baby bats learn to speak just like you learned to speak. Your parents spoke to you and you babbled back at them until you learned the words in your language. That's exactly what bats do. They learn their dialect. Each bat family has a dialect. The parallels with the world of human communication are striking and obvious and very profound. So bats are just one example. Scientists are listening to a whole range of species, again, many of which are making sounds of which humans are not aware. One of my favorite examples is the peacock, the famous mating dance you think of as a visual display. The peacock is actually 
um, giving a rock concert. That tail is an acoustic resonator. It makes very loud infrasound. We cannot hear it. The female peahens can. And the realm of hi uh, nature's hidden sounds, this was only known, this was only discovered about 10 years ago, although, of course, we've um, lived with and known about peacocks for millennia. So nature's hidden sounds are now becoming clear to scientists across the tree of life. Even species without ears or any apparent means of hearing are actually exquisitely sensitive to sound. This is a coral larva. It's one of the simplest, simplest animals that one can find. It has no central nervous system. It is covered in little hairs, cilia, the same sorts of hairs that are inside your ears, the relevance of which I'll come back to in a moment. But scientists have recently discovered that even simple organisms like coral larvae have an exquisitely sensitive sense of hearing. If you've ever gone diving somewhere like the Great Barrier Reef, and you've ever had the privilege to be there at one of the mass spawning events, it's like the whole Great Barrier Reef, which is of course so large that it's visible from space, um, one of the oldest living organisms in the world, thousands of years old, the entire reef spawns at the same time. It's like these mass underwater fireworks. The cor the, these multicolored coral larvae wash out to sea. Scientists used to believe that they were then randomly pushed around by wind, waves, and currents. It's certainly easy to believe an organism like this is basically hapless and helpless. But it turns out using digital bioacoustics, we have now discovered that these organisms can not only hear the sounds of the ocean around them. They can distinguish the sounds of healthy reefs. Moreover, they can distinguish the sound of their home reef and swim back towards it across miles of open ocean. The way they do that is those cilia, the same as inside your ears. You can think of a coral larva as basically an inside out ear. It senses the information encoded in the vibration. Hearing with its entire body, it means that its sense of hearing is actually profoundly more sensitive than our own. The same, by the way, applies to plants. So next time you see someone talking to their plant, maybe they're a little less crazy than you think. Our planet itself makes sound. If you had these digital acoustic recorders at your disposal, if you were able to hear deep in the deepest infrasound, what you would hear is the howl of hurricanes, um, earthquakes, um, create these infrasonic tremors that resonate the atmosphere like a quiet bell. Uh, our planet even has a heartbeat that comes from the sound of ocean waves crashing across continental shelves. Animals can hear these sounds, even though we cannot. And what that means is that nature, um, in nature, silence is basically an illusion. And we're just waking up to this fact, again, thanks to digital tech, and the use of artificial intelligence to decode the vast sounds we're hearing. This is a spectrogram. It's one of the ways that scientists encode acoustic information. It plots frequency over time. This is a spectrogram from a tropical rainforest. A trained ecoacoustician can decode this graphic, much like a radiologist would decode an MRI or an X-ray. Different species occupy different acoustic niches. They partition space, much like um, stations on a radio dial. And within this very diverse ecosystem, we have a diversity of sounds, a degraded ecosystem. If you track this over time, it would go empty. The colors would disappear. Very degraded ecosystems are very quiet. They're like ghost towns. And because um, we are able to monitor at low cost, we're able to monitor in places humans cannot reach and without human interference, these are very powerful devices for tracking changes in biodiversity. Um, I like to say a camera will spot an animal walking down the forest path, but a microphone can hear them hiding in the bushes. People, um, scientists have actually discovered species that we thought had gone extinct using graphics like this. Uh, we recently discovered an entirely new species of blue whales in the Indian Ocean by their unique sonic imprint. The other astounding and sort of profound thing that scientists have discovered is the interconnection, the intercommunication between different species. So it turns out there's a lot of communication in nature and different species are actually talking to one another. One of my favorite examples is pollinators and plants. So 
Honeybees, if you play the, the, the frequency of a buzzing honeybee near a flower, it will respond by producing more nectar and sweeter nectar. Plants emit very high ultrasound, and that ultrasound will vary depending on whether they are dehydrated or they're stressed or they're healthy. Sounds that insects can hear, and actually AI algorithms can be trained to listen to plants and indicate simply by listening what uh, the state the plant is in, healthy or not. So interspecies communication is happening all around us. We are largely oblivious. Digital tech helps us begin to engage in this interspecies communication. And what scientists are hoping to develop is a digital equivalent of the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone, the famous archaeological artifact, which was discovered that enabled archaeologists to decode Egyptian hieroglyphics, the knowledge of which had been lost to modern society, but because two of the texts here were known and they were this, exactly the same text as the hieroglyphics, we could decode uh, and learn about ancient Egyptian culture. So the analog today is essentially um, using AI to decode non-human languages, to encode semantic relationships into geometrical, algebraic relationships, and essentially imagine a latent space for honeybee language, for whale language. Indeed, this is what scientists are now attempting to do and some entrepreneurs. It is in the realm of possibility, although not yet achieved, that one day we could have a zoological version of Google Translate. So imagine in addition to German or English, Cantonese or Cree, you might have an option for Southern Australian dolphin, East African elephant or sperm whalish. We have now decoded the specific meaning of certain signals in these languages. The question is whether we could speak back to these animals. Now, this is very difficult. Listen to this clip of honeybee language. <laughs> So that language is spatial, vibrational, positional, electrostatic. Honeybees orient their bodies to the position of the sun because they can see polarized light. That too conveys information. Translating this into something that we can use to speak back to honeybees, very, very difficult. But here's a rudimentary example. This is Tim Landgraf, a scientist in Berlin, who has worked with both computer vision to map honeybee language um, positionally as well as acoustically. And we know that honeybees have a few hundred signals. We know what some of those signals mean. There's a stop signal, there's a begging signal, there's signals to tell bees where to go to get nectar. The queen has her own signals. Now imagine trying to encode those signals back into this robot that is attempting to speak back to the hive. So attempts like this are still rudimentary. They don't always, in fact, they only rarely succeed and we, when they do, we don't know why. But what I'm suggesting is that we are on the brink of interspecies communication, digitally enabled by uh, AI, probably going to succeed by embedding that into soft robots that are uh, more or less recognized as conspecific, recognized as being members of a specific species. So that brings me to my final point. We are essentially um, about to embark on a new scientific revolution. Uh, several hundred years ago, the discovery, the invention of the microscope and telescope enabled us to not only you know, see their further into the stars and back in time, but opened up an entirely new world. The early uh, inventors of the microscope were shocked to see what they called animalcules and had no idea, of course, that the discovery of the microbial world would lead to the discovery of DNA, the ability to manipulate the code of life. So I submit to you that we are like the early inventors of the microscope. We've just invented this technology. We're looking around at a sort of world of wonders of nature sounds. We actually have really no idea where this is going to lead us. But one thing we do know for sure is that this decenters de the human in a pretty profound way. Optics decentered the human, of course, from the center of the galaxy, from the center of our solar system. Um, sonics decenters the human from the center of the tree of life. So in this case, digital technology, which is often assumed to distance us from nature, could help us to reconnect instead, but also poses some pretty profound questions about the meaning of what it means to be human in an age of artificial intelligence. So with that, I'll stop and I'll look forward to the conversation with you, Michael John.
Thank you so much, Karen, for this vision uh, of uh, a world where we can understand sperm whalish. Uh, I think this is a fascinating idea. But uh, I mean, isn't this all uh, a little bit utopian? Like when, when we think of the discussions that have happened in the last few days about uh, uh, AI and, and ethics in the human world, um, what happens when you bring that into the non-human world? I mean, surely there are all sorts of problems associated with this. Uh, I mean, is this not a... Uh, a slightly uh, rose-colored vision that you're presenting? Yes and no. I mean, you can imagine a dystopian future where technologies like this are used for ill, to domesticate species we've never previously domesticated. You could use these for precision hunting. There are all sorts of ways you can manipulate nature for human ends. Um, at the same time, um, in an era of biodiversity loss, um, as many of you know, we're undergoing the sixth mass extinction. The recent COP conference articulated a vision of preserving 30% of the surface of the earth uh, for non-humans by 2030. The sort and, of and the oceans also. And the oceans, yeah. 30 by 30. Yeah. Um, these technologies could have a very profound impact on our ability to not only monitor the health of nature, as I showed with that spectrogram, but they could also enable something even more important, which is waking up people's ability to connect with nature, feel empathy for nature, and ultimately care enough to achieve something like the 30 by 30 goal. Yeah. So w with guardrails in place, one would hope that the utopian vision would prevail over the dystopian, although that's by no means certain. Yeah, yeah and we were talking earlier about how it's gonna be more and more important to be able to monitor the health of landscapes and how acoustic uh, techniques are actually a really important part of that, like Bernie Krauss, the uh, one said that a healthy landscape is something that you see through the ears, you know, which is a wonderful expression. And, and uh, I think that this is an area where th currently there isn't really a lot of standardization and these kind of technologies could really play a strong role. Exactly. So the ability to record the sounds of an entire landscape or a soundscape at scale to produce these sorts of uh, acoustic, uh, if you like, fingerprints, um, of ecosystems is going to become th uh, the dominant environmental monitoring device that we deploy to assess biodiversity. Um, and with that, what we're able to do is track in, uh, environmental change a lot more cheaply, efficiently, and quickly, essentially in real time than we ever did in the past. And that opens up something very cool, which is the possibility of real-time environmental regulation. Environmental regulation in the 20th century had two big problems, a lack of data, and a lag time. You know, by the time we figured out who, who created the oil spill, the fish are dead. That is all gonna change. We now have a hyperabundance of data, and we have the ability to analyze that data in real time. And by using acoustic data, we have a far greater sense of um, ecosystem impacts. And that opens up an amazing set of possibilities for not only monitoring, but actually intervening to prevent pollution um, and to prevent species loss uh, in real time. I want to come back to something you said. Uh, you talked about uh, Google Translate for animals. Uh, in the book, you say possibly within two decades. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, personally, I prefer Deepl to Google Translate. But anyway, uh, is it, I mean, is, is this, this seems really far-fetched. Uh, I mean, and what would you even hear a whale saying if, it could, if you could uh, translate it? So it's not far-fetched, but it is technically complex. So we have now been able to decode the um, equivalent of words for a large number of species. So we know, for example, that elephants have a specific word for honeybee. We, have, we know that different species have different vocal signals that act as individual names. If you, if you play back the name of a dolphin, it will come to you just like um, we would respond to our name. So we know that essentially the, equi the, the equivalent of words exists. So it's not that far-fetched to imagine we could automate um, some kind of rudimentary dialogues with non-humans at all. Um, the, you know, there's a big philosophical debate about this. Wittgenstein is famous for saying, if a lion could speak, we could not understand him. Nagel's paper on what is it like to be a bat sparked a whole generation of um, essentially the belief that we cannot understand the Umwelt, the lived experience of other species. So even if they had language, we essentially couldn't access it. But what the philosophers missed 
um, is, the, is this innovative idea that it, intermediating between humans and non-humans is a set of digital technologies. Our you cannot speak like a bat, but your computer can. Mm -hmm. And so, and that is what is going to enable the breakthrough. Um, and that is what, it, and, and, and because a far greater number of species are, voc are, are, a far greater number of species are vocally active than we ever previously thought, mm -hmm. that opens up the possibility for interspecies communication, not only with charismatic megafauna like elephants and whales, but also other, uh, other species um, that might really have passed us by, like coral. And uh, when uh, Roger Payne uh, created the sounds of uh, the songs of the humpback whale at the end of the 60s, I mean, this was a uh, pivotal moment for the environmental movement. Um, is there something similar that could happen now in terms of the role of these tools in conservation? Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is a bit speculative. So, Songs of the Humpback Whale was a best-selling album that went. It's still the best-selling uh, nature album of all time. Went platinum, um, and was a major uh, shift in public consciousness that led to an end in industrial whaling. It, at the time, whales were still being hunted, and their oil used for, you know lubricant in cars for lipstick, right? Um, shocking to us now, but that was not very long ago. Um, and uh, so you could imagine something analogous to the recent, of, um, you know, uh, flurry of public attention around uh, the latest uh, iteration of uh, GPT-3, chat GPT, um, occurring when a breakthrough occurs um, with interspecies communication. I'm guessing it'll be with uh, whales, dolphins, or cetaceans. That's where the most research effort is taking place. In the meantime, there's a lot else we can do using these tools for conservation. One of my favorite examples of how these tools are being used for conservation is with respect to whales. Um, there are highly endangered whale species across um, the oceans, especially off the coasts of North America. What has been done in this case is use bioacoustics to triangulate the location of whales. That locational information is transmitted in real time to ship's captains and fishers. The ship's captains and fishers are required to slow down and move out of the area where the whales are located. Um, and what this has done is, is eliminate one of the major causes of whale death, which is ship strikes, essentially traffic accidents, while also reducing noise pollution. So imagine this, only 50 years ago, we were harpooning and machine gunning whales in our oceans. And today we have these systems that allow, in this case with the North Atlantic right whale, a population of less than 400 whales simply by singing controls the movements of tens of thousands of ships in a watershed that's home to 45 million people. We essentially have a system of whale lanes in the ocean that take priority over human shipping lanes. And that's sort of the future of environmental conservation. I see that through bioacoustics, through non-humans expressing their preferences, we actually create um, a system of participatory environmental regulation where non-humans have some agency. They're certainly better protected. And regardless of whether or not we achieve interspecies communication, we're going to be doing a much, much better job at environmental conservation because of these technologies. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, just before, just to, we're going to come to an end, but uh, just to mention actually, if any of you are interested in this, um, apart from reading Karen's book, we also have a bioacoustic project right here in Munich called Dawn Chorus. So in the month of May, uh, you can actually go out and record the sounds of birdsong at dawn. It's a project initiated by Biotopia, and it's a great way to, I mean, there are many such projects, but it's really a great way to get involved in this yourselves. Uh, and uh, just to end, I would love it, maybe one thought that you'd like to uh, um, end with for, for the audience, or one, one last uh, final thought before we finish up. So uh, the Dawn Chorus is a beautiful project. There's something very, very moving and transcendent about being out at dawn, listening to nature. So I really encourage people to get involved in the Dawn Chorus project. Um, one, one final thought is for this audience. This is an audience of entrepreneurs. Often I'm speaking to environmentalists. Um, the, the, the 30 by 30 goal, this goal of addressing this massive biodiversity challenge is one that offers a lot of scope for your engagement, your involvement. Um, there's a lot of entrepreneurship possibilities. So I hope that each of you spend some time thinking about not only what you learned today, but how um, an entrepreneurship avenue might open up where you can be contributing to what is an urgent, urgent goal, which is um, slowing and perhaps even reversing biodiversity loss and, and regenerating the planet. So thanks. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh,